as some of you guys know, I'm a little bit crazy. And not only do I run a telescope rig in my backyard every, uh, every night that it's clear, I run, I currently run three telescope rigs in my backyard every night it's clear and still manage to sleep most of the time. <laughs> and uh, now that I live in Albuquerque, I get to do this even more nights a year. Um, so I want to I want to tell you a little bit about um, how I do this and how you can get started in using at least one rig and maybe you'll become crazy like me and want to do more than one because there's so many things to take pictures of in space and so little time. So uh, for those interested, here's some of the specifics on the rigs that I'm currently running. So this is the primary rig with uh, I upgraded from the C8 to the Celestron nine and a quarter Edge HD and I have to say the Edge HD optics are awesome. Um, I have a 2600 MC Pro on there, so one shot color camera on the Skywatcher mount. Um, I have a, a got really nice Asado focuser from Prima Lucha Lab. Uh, I run a couple Optolong light pollution and narrowband filters in there, plus a couple of interesting Antlia filters they sent me to review. Uh, I, I do use the off-axis guider on that, and that's been going really well. And I actually recently put the reducer back on that telescope. Um, to, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of go back and forth on whether I want to use the reducer or not. And uh, each of these rigs now has its own computer to run it. So this one has a little in Intel NUC that, that runs it with pretty like modest specs, to be honest. You don't really need much to run these things. This is what I call secondary. Uh, this is Takahashi that I got a couple years ago. It's now, I just bought an Ioptron HAE29 as an almost graduation present. <laughs> and um, it's it's the new one of their new strain wave mounts, and that's been kind of fun to learn how to use. Uh, Optolong LRGB SHO filters on here. Uh, I I did I picked up a used Eagle Three, which has been really fun from Prima Lucha to have a computer that is usually dedicated for astronomy, and it's got power and switchable USB ports, and that's been really nice a really nice addition to that. Plus, I got a solar telescope. Uh, two years ago, something like that, a couple years ago. And then uh, a couple years ago, um, I started doing variable star photometry for the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And I swapped out an 8-inch F4 newt for an 8-inch F5 newt because it had a longer back focus. And that allowed me to actually put a coma corrector into the, the train, which both telescopes sorely needed. Um, I have a QSI 583 that uh, was donated to me by a member of AAVSO. And I finally decided to stop trying to run that on the AVX and put it over on the Paramount where it belongs. And uh, I've got a, its own little computer for that as well. So I am just finally got my transformation coefficients measured so I can start submitting observations again. I've been paying, paying particular attention to T Corona Borealis, which is that star that's going to go Nova sometime this summer, keeping a close eye on it. And then uh, soon I'm going to be rebuilding this rig. I'm going to take that RC that I also picked up from an astronomy friend. And um, uh, that's probably going to go on the Ioptron 740. That's not currently being used since I got the HAE. Uh, but I'm probably going to need another computer to run it because I, I, I tried running multiple rigs on one computer and USB devices were always getting kicked off and I finally got tired of it. So one computer per rig is really helping me out here. And those NUC, the Intel NUCs, they're, you know, three, 400 bucks, nothing crazy. And then uh, I might eventually put together a fifth rig as well. I still have uh, two functioning Celestron AVX mounts and uh, one that I might be able to fix. And I've got this AstroTech uh, doublet as well. And yeah, just, I don't know. I got enough stuff to put together another rig, although I don't have another cooled camera. So I'll have to mess around with that. And yes, I really do leave them up year round, including in Ohio. And that's all made possible by these Telegizmos 365 covers. This is a picture from day before yesterday when it poured rain like crazy here in Albuquerque. You can see how wet my backyard is. And I went to go check on how well the covers were doing and everything was nice and dry underneath of them. So uh, they're still doing very well. So if you want to get into uh, having even just one rig in your backyard that you can run every night, uh, I'm going to go through how to start with that and kind of tools for success. And because now I'm at a point where I use the Nina scheduler and I just turn on my sequence and hit go and go to bed. And it's great because I can get enough sleep to do my day job. <laughs> so 
uh, some tools for success, a good tracking mount. And I'm just going to sound, it might sound crazy, but honestly, having a high quality mount is better than having a high quality telescope. Spend money on the mount first, spend money on the telescope second. Like you can get nice images from a cheap doublet as long as you have a mount that has that tracks well. And you could have a super fancy Takahashi, but if it's on a mount that doesn't track well, or that doesn't guide well, no amount of Takahashi goodness of optics is going to help streak stars. So uh, yeah, mount first, telescope second. Uh, it's really helpful if it has home position and uh, limit switches or sensors. That helps. Uh, that helps with safety during the night. Make sure that, that like the camera doesn't hit the tripod. Um, that it will it will park. It can find home and stuff like that. Um, those are really helpful to have. And obviously being able to control it via USB on a computer. Uh, electronic focuser is not a necessity if you just want to get started, but you're going to quickly find that you want one. For a lot of, a lot of refractors, like my Takahashi in particular, the uh, temperature changes adjust focus very quickly and many, many times a night. So I'm uh, refocusing a lot during the night. On uh, Schmidt Cassegrain's mirror flop, a little bit less of an issue on the Edge HD series, but um, was definitely an issue on some of my, like my C11, for example. Uh, on Newtonians, because of the cameras hanging so far down away from the tube uh, and the way that it's not exactly balanced, um, you can get flexure, and so you might want to, you know, need to refocus with that sometimes. And for any of them, if you're using more than one filter, you got to be able to, like, no two filters are truly par focal, even if they're from the same brand. Um, being able to refocus per filter is great. Electronic filter wheel, if you need a filter wheel. I Even on my one-shot color camera, I have a filter wheel because I use a light pollution filter and multi-narrow band filters. So in the same night, before the moon comes up, I, I'll do wide band. And then when the moon comes up, I'll switch to my narrow band targets. Ne this Nina scheduler does this automatically. And um, that way I can do both and be able to take advantage of as many nighttime hours as possible without having to go make configuration changes every night. A uh, dedicated computer, uh, one of those little headless nooks or something like that is really all you need. Does not need to have good specs. As you saw, one of mine only has eight gigs of RAM and an Intel uh, i3 seventh gen. Actually, no, it was i5. Still seventh gen now. Um, and uh, either use like a Wi-Fi antenna or I have all my stuff is hardwired. I run an Ethernet cable into the house and that goes into my from my outside router to my inside router. Uh, but I have been able to do some stuff over Wi-Fi in the past. If you want to leave it out and not have to repolo on it every night, having a telescope cover like the Telegismos 365 is great. And just lots and lots of practice. Uh, moonlit and poor transparency nights are great times to work out bugs like um, guiding parameters. And uh, uh, I don't actually align my mounts. I just have plate solving, get them on target. So I don't spend time dealing with alignment models and stuff like that. Um, but there's a lot of practice of like, Making sure everything in your sequence makes sense. Double checking that the meridian flip happens when you when you expect it to. Um, putting in some error checking in the Nina sequence so that it can recover over the course of the night and stuff like that. Uh, and it's like like I mentioned when I was out in California, I was able to uh, iterate, iterate, iterate because I was able to work on it every night that it was clear, which was a lot of nights, and finally get to a steady state where. Like I still wake up in a panic occasionally in the middle of the night because I think I hear rain or I think I hear the mount slewing weird or something like that. But uh, yeah, I've, I've never had any true disasters. I've had a couple of, uh, you know, I have to go run and cover the scopes, uh, but that's usually in the daytime, actually not the nighttime. Um, but uh, yeah, I mostly, I sleep pretty well these these nights, yeah. Um, so I uh, really take it one step at a time. If you try to get all of the devices at the same time and try to get them all to work, you're going to have a really hard time and you're probably going to get really frustrated and you're going to waste a lot of nights where you could be imaging. So, um, oops, that didn't work. Okay. Um, these are supposed to go in sequential order. Uh, so I, first is to get familiar with your mount. So uh, doing some visual observing with it or using your camera, but punching in stuff in the hand controller. So that it, especially if you haven't used like an equatorial mount before, getting used to how it moves, understanding what a meridian flip is and stuff like that. Getting familiar with your camera. If you're starting with a DSLR, then take day and nighttime shots so you get familiar with the settings. What happens when you change ISO? What happens when you change exposure time? Just to get a sense of what that looks like. Uh, if you have an astro cam, practicing with sharp cap, 
taking both long exposure and short exposure images in SharpCap is great for just getting instant feedback on what things look like and stuff like that. Uh, then pair them out in the camera together. And uh, my, I, I do recommend adding auto guiding first because then you're gonna be able to take uh, those longer exposures. And while it can seem like a big hurdle, once you figure it out the first time, it actually works, tends to work pretty well after that. Um, these next couple, not as exactly a strict order, but a suggested order to consider is um, adding a filter wheel and then just like um, doing some manual focus runs, adding an electronic focuser. Uh, and then uh, like you can you can kind of be doing some of these like um, like taking images live and sharp cap and stuff like that. Uh, but once you kind of get familiar with the hardware, then it's time to start looking at your sequencing software. And in my opinion, there's pretty much nothing that beats Nina right now. Um, and uh, yes, I've been using Nina for the last couple of years. Uh, I used to use Secret Generator Pro, but Nina just blew it out of the water, so I quit using it. Uh, adding the Auto Meridian Flip can be a bit terrifying at first. I highly recommend practicing this during the day because you don't need stars to be able to at least like double check that it that it does the flip, even if it even if you don't do the other steps of like focusing and stuff like that or in the early part of the evening, if you want to go through the whole procedure of focus, flip, focus, and stuff like that. Uh, being able to remotely access your computer is really handy. And I think I have some notes on that here in a second on what, what ways to do that. Then you can start adding multiple targets to your sequence. And so it's slewing around the different targets over the course of the night. And then finally, you can sleep. And then eventually, when you get comfortable with sequencing, you start looking at the target scheduler, which makes all the decisions for you on what targets you should run that night with the moon and with what time things are rising and stuff like that. So I don't have to go hand jam it every night. So uh, some quick notes on power management. I got these. I got one, some of these large power enclosure boxes from Amazon that are rainproof and mostly bug proof. And I just put a surge protector in there. I keep all the ACDC bricks inside to keep them safe from water. I use some Wi-Fi enabled outlet switches. Um, if you're gonna use a USB hub, get one with external power. Otherwise you will perennially have issues with your devices. Like this, make sure you have one that has some kind of USB or five volt plug-in. And uh, you can also use boxes like the Pegasus for scope top power and USB to help reduce the number of cables that run down the mount. As far as cable management goes, it's really important to keep cables from snagging through the night. That's one of the safety things of being able to run all night. So I got this self-closing uh, cable sheath that um, the way I, I hang it on the telescope in a particular way so that when it moves around, it kind of ends up moving away from the mount. And this you can practice during the day doing like flip it over one, one direction, go all the way south, and then do a meridian flip to the south on the other side. Do that a couple times, just make sure that nothing's gonna get caught. Plus it makes it much easier to assemble and disassemble the mount when all the cables are together. As far as remote access goes, uh, I prefer using Windows RDP, a remote desktop. And uh, now the computer you're connecting to needs to have Windows, like Windows 11, Windows 10, et cetera, Pro in order to use RDP. But whatever computer you're connecting from does not need to have Pro. In fact, you can connect to that, to that Windows computer from a Mac or I do it from my phone in my bed sometimes just to check that things are going well. Uh, there's a Microsoft Store app version or there's old fashioned Windows remote desktop service as well. And this work, the nice thing with that is that it works without internet connection. So when I go to star parties, I just set up a local, a local area network and I can log in to all my computers from the star party with no internet. If you mainly image from home and you have internet, then uh, Chrome remote desktop is, is free and easy to, and it, you don't need um, Windows Pro to use it. There's a couple others like No Machine and AnyDesk as well. Um, yeah, I think I'm going a little long on time. So I'll, I'm gonna skip through how to actually build a Nina sequence, but I do wanna talk a little bit about what Nina has in it. Uh, and uh, it, it is Windows only, but honestly, you probably don't wanna leave your MacBook outside anyways. So you may as well get a little itty bitty Windows computer. And then you can control it from your MacBook inside if you want has full equipment control over everything from cameras to domes. It'll control domes and all kinds of other stuff in between. The advanced sequencer lets you set the exact order of things you want to happen. So for instance, uh, when I use Sequence Generator Pro, 
it would um, focus first and then sort of the target. Well, it's like, okay, when I was in California, I didn't have a view of the North Celestial Pole where like, I didn't have a view of North where the telescope is in a home position. So I couldn't run, I'd run focus before I started the sequence every night. Here, I can have it slew, focus, and then do the centering where it uses plate solution to get on target. So that way I'm for sure in focus when I, when I do plate solution. And I'm for sure on some stars when I go to do an autofocus. And it has, you can check for conditions. You can, if you have safety monitoring devices, you can, it can check for those conditions. You can build reusable templates, all kinds of stuff. Um, it'll even uh, skip over targets if they're too close to the moon. Uh, yeah, you can, it has a target catalog that makes it easy to find targets or to at least get them in the sequence. A framing assistant, which is great for um, if you want to set up like a particular composition or if you want to do a mosaic. Flat wizard, which is really nice. It, it determines the exposure times for you. Um, yeah, I'm not going to have time to go through the example sequence, but sometime I'll do a show specifically on building a Nina sequence if we haven't done one too recently. Um, I download all my data in the morning. And I go blink through it. It picks insight while I'm eating breakfast. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah, lots of other useful functions. Um, yeah, I'll skip over those. Yes, and the target scheduler, which is what I use exclusively now on all three of my rigs, so I don't have to go and check. Okay, is this target too close to the moon tonight? Uh, is this what, what time? Is this target setting? I, it'll do all the all the decisions for me, and so I just have to check and you know check every once in a while that I don't need to add any more targets uh, because the season's changing and stuff like that, or it's not continuing on a target that I'm done with. But uh, it makes it much easier. And thanks to uh, Tom Palmer for uh, uh, for building that. He's he's got a whole show on on our show on uh, on the scheduler. So check that out if you're interested. Um, yeah, when in doubt, reboot only change one thing at a time to isolate a problem. Sometimes it's a power issue, sometimes it's a USB issue, sometimes it's a cable issue. USB is the worst, disconnect, reconnect. Um, and uh, sometimes bad guiding is just due to, due to seeing or transparency, not your mount. So unless you're getting consistently poor guiding, have some patience. And, but most of all persist. Like there's nights where I've wanted to throw the rig at the wall. Uh, but oh, there's a lot of good nights where I go to bed and I image and get up in the morning and download my images and they're all great. Um, so persist and you'll be able to start getting lots and lots of subframes quickly so you can start processing them. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of hard work, but totally worth it. And I get a lot of sleep these days. And that's what I got. Hey Molly, Thanks, Molly. There, I, I, there was just one question, I didn't interrupt you. You mentioned that you had a filter wheel on a color camera, was that like a five or a seven and you just use a couple positions on it? So I have a five and I actually use all five positions. I have a luminance filter when I go to star parties or dark sky sites. I have a light pollution filter, the L Pro. I have um, a, a dual narrowband filter, the L Ultimate. Uh, I have an Antlia tri-band RGB Ultra, which is kind of a cool like wide band, narrow band, um, uh, like it's, it's kind of kind of somewhere between wide band and narrow band. It's been kind of fun to play with. They sent it to me as a review article. And then they also sent me an S S2 H beta filter, which you can combine with an H alpha oxygen three filter and create Hubble palette images with a one shot color camera by using those two filters. So yes, I use all five slots. Okay. And I did do believe we had the one uh, question. And you're right, we need a, a longer show on the scheduler itself. So we'll, we'll be getting into that later.